Right, okay, so I make it two minutes past, so it's uh, time to kick off. So I notice numbers have dropped slightly, I think. We'll uh, see. Right, so this is a lecture 10. This is, um, as I see it, excuse me, thank you, as I see it, the final lecture, really. So there's a timetabled slot next week, uh, which is the last day of term, and normally turnout's pretty low. So I would use that to go through exam papers, and this will be the last day when I deliver you new material. You'll be very pleased to know. Right, <coughs> so let's go. Oh, this is called Final Important Things and the Last Exam Paper. So uh, there's a few things I haven't managed to teach you throughout the course, so over the last nine lectures. And this has really been just because they didn't fit in, or they just would confuse you a bit, or, uh, you know, they just didn't fit in the lectures I've had. So I've got about three or four topics that would ideally fit in different lectures, so fit in the, the, the lecture about for loops or lecture about if statements. We're just going to ha hammer these little points, and uh, they're things that are very well worth knowing. Ah, I need to turn on my pointer. Right, so... I've got some announcements. So coursework deadline, as you all know, is uh, Thursday, 10th December, uh, 3 p.m. via Moodle. Um, we'll no longer be using C20, but you all know that. So we've got uh, ESLC top floor and C19, which would give us just over 200 computers. So that should be enough. Um, if, so if you go and sit in, you can go, you're, still, you're still very welcome to go and sit in C20, uh, but there just won't be any demonstrator support at all there. Um, if, obviously, every turns up in about an hour and wants, wants lots of help in C20, then we'll obviously open the room again. But uh, this is really to help the third and fourth year students uh, who are trying to do coursework. So, yes, next lecture is, last day of, is on the last day of term. Um, I'll go through... Basically, I'll do what you want me to do. So if you email me questions, if you email me exam questions you can't do, I will run through it in that hour. So that hour is for you. There's no more, like, programmed material. I'll, I'll do what you want on that day. Um, after the, after the, uh, the, the last lecture, we've officially got a two-hour examples class where it's actually programmed and the university doesn't shut till about 12 or 1 o'clock. Um, now, normally, nobody turns up. Normally, we get about one person. Um, so I'm not running an example class for one person. So if more than 2% of the people turn up, so if six people turn up, then I'll have like a demonstrator or two demonstrators to help you out with any questions you might have. But if nobody turns up, yeah. So it's up to you how much support you get during that session. Turn up if you want help. So here's an overview of today's lecture. I can just hear talking. I, I can't talk over you. Thank you. Um, so here's an overview of today's lecture. I want to teach you Newton's method. Now, Newton's method really fits in the section about algorithms. So this is really an algorithm. It's a very, very powerful algorithm, and it complements your integration, your differentiation algorithms, and your sorting algorithms. Then I want to talk about breaking loops early. So this is quite an important topic. Um, and there's not, we don't do that much on it, but you can definitely go and practice that on your own. <coughs> then I want to talk about combining if statements and switch statements. So this is algorithms, this is loops, and this is if statements. So it's sort of a, a rollover of everything. And the final thing I want to talk about is free software and then we'll get on to last year's exam. So this man here is called Newton, and you all know him. In fact, he's a very famous man because he's effectively written by himself the first three years of your degree course. So he effectively invented integration, differentiation, so that's your maths. He invented solid mechanics, so it's called Newtonian mechanics, right, because he did it. Um, also fluid dynamics, he, he started to do some of the early work on that. So in effect, this man wrote the, the mechanical engineering degree. And also, he, he lived and uh, not, or well, he was born not very far from here. You can actually go and visit his apple tree still in Grantham, just down the road. So if you've got nothing to do tomorrow, you can go and see his apple tree, or one of, one, an apple from that tree or something. Now, he, he's got a method called Newt, Newton's method that was named after him. And my view is this is the most powerful method there is to solve systems of equations. So I've taught you integration. You can now integrate any equation that, that's given to you. I've taught you differentiation. You can differentiate any equation that's given to you. Um, and I'm now going to teach you effectively how to solve any equation that's given to you. So any equation at all. And it's a fantastically powerful method. It was published in 1617 by him. And it's still actually the best method available for solving equations. There is no better method. And I use it today, um, actually today, to solve systems of, sort of a, million, a million equations without any problems at all. So um, this is not a trick question. If you got given this in a GCSE maths exam and they said, what's the answer to this equation? When does this equation equal zero? 
what would the answers be? Three and 40, fantastic. So this is not a trick question. Three and 40, you got that, fantastic. So the whole next 20 slides or so is going to be about solving equations like this. So basically any equation, finding that they're called the roots. So the root of this equation is 3 and 40, so when it equals 0. About solving equations that you can't necessarily see the answer to, so obviously like that. So sometimes you have, you have to use, for example, um, the, uh, the, the uh, what's it called, the, 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 you know the equation with the square root to solve to solve these equations. Sometimes you can use that, but very often in engineering, you just don't have a nice equation like that to, to get hard to find answers. So we're going to basically teach you a general method to solve any equation you want. So then, another way to write this equation would be f of x equals brackets x minus 3, x minus 40. So we're basically saying that we've got a function of x, which is this, and it's equal to f of x. Now, if, we, if, we couldn't sol if at school, when you were 16, you couldn't solve that, it was too complicated to solve, what you could have done is written out like this. So you've gone f of x equals x minus 3 minus 40. And then you'd have plotted a graph of f of x against x. So what you could have done is on graph paper varied x. So boom, 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 boom. And then plotted f of x. And when f of x crossed the y-axis, um, so x equals 3 and x equals 40, you, you knew you'd have found a root. So this is quite another way to find roots of equations. So just so we all know what we're talking about. So, when does this equation equal zero? Don't know, right? No idea. I mean, if we're trying to be clever, we might try and figure out when cos was zero or when tan was infinite. But to be honest, I've got no idea what the roots of this equation are. But this method will be able to, t with this method, is Newton's method, you'll be able to solve equations like this, just like that, without any problems at all. So let's have a go at that. So, there's three steps to Newton's method, basically. And if you pay attention for about the next 10 slides, you'll get it. And if you don't pay attention to the next 10 slides, you won't. <laughs> okay? So um, it's quite easy. So don't, don't get scared by the maths. So we've got, we've got this equation here. Now, this could be a really complicated equation, but I'm just going to make it a nice, easy quadratic so we can all see what's going on to kick off with. So imagine we want to find the roots of this equation. Newton said the first thing you've got to do is differentiate it with respect to x. So boom. So f, f dash x means the differential. Okay? So we've got the equation and we've got the differential with respect to x. So, uh, two, so x squared is 2x, uh, 10x is 10, and 3 disappears. Easy peasy so far, OK? Um, now, oh, all, these, all these are on Moodle, by the way, so don't bother about frantically writing down. Now, um, this is where I need my pen. So we've now got to guess. So I want you to, well, we're going to guess together what the answer to this equation could be. So. Do we think, so let's put it on this board, so our first guess, do we think zero is an answer to the equation? Is zero an answer to that equation? No, okay, thank you, thank you for shouting out. So we've got x here, and I'll put zero. What's the equation when, when x is zero? What's it equal? x is zero, what do we get? Right, okay, minus three. Right, let's have, so this is f of x. OK, now let's make another really bad guess at the equation. What about if x is 100? OK, so 100 times 100 is um, 1 to the 4. Um, 100 times 10 is 1 to the 3. So we've got 1.1 times 10 to the 4 minus 3. So 100 is another really bad guess. So we'll put in 100. And we get 1.1 times 10 to the 4. I'll just put, I'll just put minus 3 because I can't be bothered to write that out. So those are two really bad guesses. Well, let's make another guess. So it's, it's somewhere between 0 and 100, right? So 10 might be a more sensible guess. So let's try 10. OK. So what do we get if we put 10 into that equation? 10, uh, 10 times 10 plus 10 times 10 is 200 minus 3 is 197. OK. So 0 is a bad guess. It's quite close, though. Uh, 100 is a terrible guess, and 10 is a moderately bad guess. Now, I can't actually be bothered to guess anymore, because it's just a waste of time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use our, our guess, which in this case, I'm going to say that my best guess to the answer to this equation is 10. I think that's the best guess. It's also the easiest guess to deal with. It's a really bad guess, but it doesn't matter, because Newton's method is going to solve this equation for us, starting with our guess. So what Newton said is, firstly, using our really bad guess of x... So, so in this case, 10. 
using our really bad guess of x, evaluate the equation. Okay? So we're going to evaluate f of x, and that is 197, just as I put there. He then said, evaluate the differential of x. And so 10 times uh, 2 is 20, plus 10 is 30. So the differential of x is 30. All with me so far? Yeah? Now, he then said, use this equation. So this is called, well, I'm not quite sure what it's called, but it's the equation in Newton's method. He said, use this equation to get yourself a better guess of x. So this is going to be x plus 1 is going to be our better guess of x. So what's x? 10. Boom. Easy. Uh, what's f of x? 197. I can't remember what f dash to x is, so I'm not going to ask you. f dash to x is 30. So we've got everything we need to evaluate this right-hand side of the equation. So we just plot those numbers in, and we get a better guess of x. So 3.433. So that is a better guess of x. Okay. Then he said, so this is Newton, this clever guy, he said, take this better guess of x and stuff it back into the equation and evaluate everything again. Okay. So we know, so what's x? Three point, yeah, exactly, 3.433. Uh, I won't ask what f of x is because uh, at 3.433 because I couldn't evaluate it in my head. But it is, because I put it into the computer, 43.115. And f dashed of x at 3.433 is 16.866. So now we can make an even better guess of x by just solving the right hand, you're all ill, solving the right hand side of this equation. And our even better guess of x is 0.8. 87697. So what we do is we basically just pop this answer back in here, pop it in, round, 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 until we get an answer that converges to a nice answer. And this is all you need to do to solve any equation before. So all this sort of, you know, expanding brackets and stuff that you've been doing at school, you've been wasting your time. You, sh you, sh you should have been using New Newton's method, and you'd have got these problems solved in seconds. Okay? So this will solve any equation for you. So I'm going to I'm going to just run through it again. So I, this is the steps to Newton's method. I give you an equation. Okay? You differentiate that equation with respect to x. So that's step one. Then you guess. you guess. You guess the value for the equation. It can be wrong. You know, it can be way out. It doesn't matter. So I guess 10. You then you evaluate the right-hand side of this equation. So you go x, f of x, over f dash brackets x and you get a better guess of x plus 1. You stick it back in, go round and round and round, until you get an answer for x. Any questions so far? Anybody baffled? Shout now. I'm very happy to go over stuff. Okay? Good. So, um, let's integrate this, or let's do this in MATLAB. So, as you guessed, this is an algorithm and a loop. And we can do this in MATLAB incredibly easily. So, here's x equals 10. Okay? So, this is our first guess. Then we've got a for loop. So we've got a for loop from here to here. So this will go i equals 1, i equals 2, i equals 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we repeat it 10 times, OK? So we're evaluating this equation 10 times. We then go, first line of the for loop, y equals x times x plus 10x minus 3. So that's just f of x. So that's this equation here. We then, so this is the differential, and I've called it, you can't do f dash brackets things in uh, in uh, MATLAB, so you, you, you can't, you can't, well, we, we can't write out that, so I've just called it dy. So dy, so the differential of this, is 2x plus 10. And then, this is the Newton equation, so we go new x, so the new x is x minus y over dy. And then the final line sets the, the old x equal to new x. And then when we go back around the top, we've got in x, basically our better guess. So every time we go around this, we're going to increase our, or improve our guess of x for the equation. Okay? Excuse me. Oop. Any questions on the MATLAB code? No? Right. Let's look, at, let's look at it in action. Ready? Go. Right, so I think I've got it in the clipboard, so I'm going to copy and paste the, the code into MATLAB. Okay. I'll just put clear at the beginning. And we're going to click run. 
Okay, so let's go and look at it. So look at, look at what we've got. Oh, I think we scroll up to the top now. So let's scroll up to the top. We, we, we kicked off with our guest, our guest of 10. Next guest was 3.433, just as we calculated on pen and paper. You got a question? You got a question? Yeah, shout it out, please, please. You're, sure? Okay, because if you're thinking, lots of other people are thinking it too, so please shout. Sure? Okay. Right, first guess. Then first guess of Newton's method Im improves it. Second guess improves it again, improves it again, improves it again, improves it again. And can you see here, the answer's not being improved because we found our root. Can you see sort of the, the, error, the error keeps going down and, we've, and we, we've got to the root of our equation. So that's it. That's Newton's method. So with this, um, let's go back. So with this script, you can solve any equation, any equation at all, okay? Um, so you just replace this line and this line, and it'll find the roots for you. If you want to get the different roots of the equation, so if you've got one root at 10 and one root at, say, 40, just set the guess to closer to one root than the other, and Newton's method will find whichever, whichever root you're looking for. Okay? That's that. If I can find my thingy. Right, so we're now going to stop uh, Newton's method. Any questions before I move on? Yes? Yeah, so sometimes that's a very good question. So the question was, what happens, what happens if I can't differentiate the equation? Now that actually quite often happens. You get an equation that's just too difficult to differentiate because it's like that long, or you just can't be bothered to differentiate it. Do you remember in the, in the algorithms lecture, we, we did differentiating, and, and I said what you need to do is find like evaluate the equation over a small change in x and calculate a small change in y. So all you do is you replace that like analytical derivative with like, you know, x, so y evaluates at one point, y evaluates at another point, and just go dy by dx, and you've got it. Okay? So you really can't, you don't even, so it's a really good question, you don't even need to be able to differentiate to do this. Okay? Yeah, go for it. Uh, no, no, it's not square root, it's a, it's a root of the equation. Yeah, so, so it's a... Um, so the equation we were looking at was this, and that's a, 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 a quadratic of, of, of form like that, so it had two roots. So what's your, what's your question? What about the other root? Yeah, so, th so, I, what, so what I said is... Um, So can you see here, we've started off with a guess at 10. Okay, that'll find the root that's nearest to 10. But if you've got, an, if you've got another root at, say, 100, you start off at, at say, 110, and it will, it'll go and find that nearest root. Okay, that's another really good question. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Uh, then what you can do is you can write... You see, I've got all the answers to this. I do, I do this a lot. <laughs> Um, what you can then do is you can basically put another for loop outside of here, or a while loop, and you can like go through your whole space where you think your solution might exist. So you might try one with 10, you might like you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And what will happen is if you give it like the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it might find the root at, say, 1. And then once you start getting nearer the next root, it will start giving the, root, the next root. So you, if you scan the space, it will give you the solution. Okay? Any other questions? They're all really good questions. Fantastic. Thanks all for asking questions. Okay. Oh, yeah. So the final thing is, what, what we're now doing is quite long loops, uh, and this is quite an irritating process if you, if, if you get it wrong, um, because the computer will just run it forever. The, the top tip I don't think I've told all of you is Control-C. If you press Control-C, it'll just stop the computer running a loop, and you can save a lot of time like that. Right. Breaking loops early. So... Um, this is like just one of those mop, mopping up topics that, uh, that um, I'm going to stand here. This is like one of those mopping up topics. Um, I block you now because I've been blocking those people. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that uh, really fits in the loop section, but it's quite useful and well worth knowing. So let's like practice algorithms. Let's go through this al algorithm together. So what this, and we'll try and figure out what it does. <clears throat> it's a little bit pointless, but it's just a good practice at understanding code. So r equals round 100 comma 1. So this will make an array of 100 random numbers. Okay? Then we go found equals 0. Then we go 4i equals 1 to 100. So this is going to loop here, here, here. So run this 
from i equals 100, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 98, 99, 100. Then we go with this if statement. If the ith value of r is bigger than 0.5, okay, so if the ith value of r is bigger than 0.5, then if the ith value of r is smaller than 0.53, found equals 1, end, end. So the if block is this, basically, and we will only set found equals 1 if the ith value of r is between 0.5 and 0.53. And then we go at the end, if found equals 1, found. So what this algorithm is doing, it's a little bit silly, but it's a good example of an algorithm you might need to write, is it's searching an array for a value. And if there's a value between 0.5 and 0.53, then it says I found the value. Okay? So how many times will this, well, I've told you the answers, but how many times will this, will this for loop run? 100, yeah? Now then, imagine we find a value that's between 0.5 and 0.53 in the first element of the array. So we found the value, like in the first time we go through this. How many times will this for loop run? It's not a trick question. 100. Because it doesn't stop. Because whatever happens, even if found's one, it just goes through one, two, three. It doesn't know we found the value, okay? It'll just keep going forever. So it's, it's like wasting computer time because the computer's found what we're looking for and this thing's still going through there. Look, it doesn't help us, you know. So we're wasting CPU cycles. And this is maybe trivial if we've got 100 data points. But if you're searching an array of, an array of like, um, 10 gigabytes of data, a search through the array is non-trivial and it can take an hour. So you want to stop as soon as you've found the value. So we need some type of way to basically terminate this for loop once we've found the solution. So what we use is we use the break command. What the break command does is says basically, stop the for loop. I am no longer interested in the for loop. So what happens here now is it runs through this, runs through this, this array looking for a value that we're interested in. So between bigger than 0 0.5 or smaller than 0.53. Sets found equal to 1. But now we put this break command in. And as soon as it finds this, it's just going to stop. It's going to exit the loop, go to the end, and go found equal to 1 found. Okay. So it's a way of like terminating loops early. It's very useful, saves you loads of computational time. So, here's a trick question. It's not a trick question. We've got a for loop here, i equals 1 to 100, with this if statement in it, the break command end. How many times will that for loop run? I'll wait for somebody else. I heard that answer. Somebody at the back. 10. Thank you very much, with hands. <laughs> so this will run 10 times, because we go for loop, i equals 1 to 100, then we wait, we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If i equals 10, break end, and then it exits. So it's just a nice way of, of ending loops early. So did you notice in the, in the Newton's method, if you're very eagle-eyed, um, that after maybe the third iteration or the fourth iteration, we already found the answer, so it told us what the root was. And, but the, because we, we put Newton's method in a for loop, it kept basically computing again and again and again, trying to improve the guess and improve the guess, although it found it. So it's wa again, wasted CPU cycles. So what we can do in Newton's method is we can go, if new x, so this is just the Newton's method code, if new x, so this is the new value of, of the root, is minus x, so we basically find the difference between the old and the new value, is smaller than 0 0.01, so when the difference has stopped, when the, when the answer stopped changing by 0 0.01, break. So it just terminates the for loop. So we've now saved, like, you know, 10 times through this loop. And, you know, this might be trivial in this example. But when you're doing this from a matrix with, like, a million elements, this is not trivial. So terminating programs early saves you loads of CPU time. Okay. Um, so that's, that's all is on the break statement. Any questions about the break statement before I continue? Okay, right. So I'm now going to do combining if statements and switch statements. So this really fits in the, the, the lecture on if statements, and, but I just didn't have time to do it. And also, I just thought sometimes it's a bit confusing if I try and teach you too much in one go. So this is just a quick recap, or just, just a quick few things that are quite important. How are we doing for time? <coughs> Ages. Right. So... Combining if statements. So you can do this. So if, I, if you want to find a value that's bigger than 10 and smaller than 15, so this is exactly the same type of uh, statement that we had here looking for a number, okay? So 
we're looking for a value of x that if x is bigger than 10, if x is smaller than 0, display OK. So this will only display OK when, um, when x is bigger than 10 and smaller than 15. Um, but there's a much better way to express this in MATLAB. So what you can do, so here's our code on the left, if x is bigger than 10, smaller than 15. What you can do is you can go if x is bigger than 10 and and. What this means, this and and means and, okay? And x is smaller than 15. So you've sort of, so I'll just say it in English again. If x is bigger than 10 and x is smaller than 15, do something. So it's a way of sort of combining this double if statement together into one line. There's also an all statement, which is, which is quite handy. So you can go, if x is bigger than 10, or x is smaller than 5, disp OK. So it's quite a handy way of like building up logic and logical tests for algorithms. Um, that's all I want to do on that. And what I suggest you do is just have a play with that. Uh, you know, just do a, bit, a, few, you know, a few goes with that with MATLAB when you have a chance. And uh, it'll all become, it'll become second nature. There's nothing very hard. Any questions on that before I move on? Okay, so I said it's a bit of a bitty lecture, but this is, this is why. Yeah, so here we go, summary. And, and is an and and and. So there's an example. Or is this double bar, or uh, it's worth finding out where that key is on the keyboard. Okay, now switch statements. Now, I was sort of in two minds about whether or not to teach you switch statements, but they're quite useful. Um, and sometimes they pop up in the exam, sometimes they don't. I don't know. But it's worth, it's worth practicing this. Um, <coughs> so if you look at this code on the right hand side so this is a very simple if else else if else end statement um, it's basically you've written this in your, in your second MATLAB coursework so we go muffins equals 3 if muffins equals 1 print more muffin else if muffins equals 2 print 2 muffins else if muffins equals 3 print 3 muffins else too many muffins so this is a typical if else else if statement um, but there's another way to do this which is potentially a bit cleaner which I'm going to talk to you about now. And this is called the switch statement. So this is the switch statement, or sometimes called the case statement. You just, just, uh, just, just try it. It looks complicated, but it isn't. So here we've got muffin equals input number of muffins. So this wants you to input the number of muffins. Then we type switch muffin. OK, so just type switch muffin. And then you type case 1, case 2, case 3, case 4. So what happens, and then you've got an end at the end. So what happens is if muffin here is equal to 1, the computer will execute this line. If muffin is equal to 2, it will execute this line. If muffin equals 3, execute this line. If muffin equals 4, execute this line. Then this otherwise, so if it doesn't match any of those conditions, execute this. So you can see it's got the same sort of form as the if, else, else, if, else, whatever statement. And there's, there's no real difference. It's just a slightly different way of doing it. Now, the reason I'm, I'm teaching this, you might think, oh, well, that's just a different way to do it. Why bother? The reason I'm, I'm teaching this is, is there's some sort of advantages to switch statements sometimes, and it's worth being aware of them. So, so well, so if you look at, um, let's, if we go back to the if, else, else, if statement. So, you've got lots of decisions here, and it looks, it looks quite complicated. And sometimes you have these if, else, else, if statements running over pages of computer programs. So maybe that long, a statement that long, maybe 100 choices. And that can be quite hard and difficult to debug. Now, allegedly, this is, what, this is what they say in the computer books anyway, allegedly, this is easier to debug, like visually, to look at, than if, else, else, if, else, if statement. Um, I don't really believe that. I think they're marginally easier to debug. But the real advantage of them, maybe not in MATLAB, but certainly in many other languages, is they actually run faster. So you can understand this because if you if you look at the if you look at this if else if statement, what the computer does it says if muffins equals one, then do something. Else if muffins equals two, do something. Else if muffins equals three, do something. Else. And can you see the computer's got to make a decision here, a decision here, a decision here, a decision here, a decision, a decision here. So if you had a hundred of these if if statements, the computer would actually have to decide a hundred times whether or not a condition is met. Now with a case statement, the computer handles it slightly differently in that it goes switch, oh, it's one, it just jumps straight there. Or if it goes, and then goes switch, oh, it's four, it just jumps straight there. There's none of that like, does it equal this, does it equal that. This is sort of more direct way, in the computer, and, it, and it's potentially a bit faster, so probably about 25% faster. And they use quite a lot, so if that comes up, um, you'll now know what it is. Um, and there's an example of this in the worksheet, uh, question 6G, worksheet 6. So that's worth knowing. 
Occasionally it pops up in the exam, sometimes not. Just ha have a play with MATLAB and that. Yep. So any questions on that before I move on? Nope. Just literally copy and paste that at, out, of the, uh, out of the notes and you'll, and you'll, be, you'll be good. So, free software. Now, this is the last, uh, this is the last, so that, that's basically all the MATLAB. We've now finished the MATLAB teaching. Now, this is the last thing I want to teach you. So I've tried to, throughout this lecture course, effectively disperse like, like nuggets of interesting things about computing and try and make you sort of excited about computing generally and not, not make it a, a drudge. So my last sort of nugget of fun that I'm going to dispatch is on free software. So I think this is a very important topic. And it won't necessarily be in the exam this time, but it's very, it's, you, you, I think you should have this as modern engineers um, working today. So um, there were lots of positive comments about the module and, and things like that from you guys um, on your set and sem. So I'll, re I'll read those out loud in a minute. Um, but I've picked out uh, four negative statements from the sem that some students wrote, all with a common theme. And I have to say, actually, these were only the only negative statements. So I'll read them. So th this is what you guys wrote. You can probably pick out who wrote them. Um, hard, to, hard to complete example worksheets from week seven onwards when doing coursework on weeks three to six, as not a lot of people have MATLAB on their personal devices. Student two. <coughs> Some way of having MATLAB full to download for free at home would be useful. Then coursework would be more likely to be computed, completed at home, blah, 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 blah. If we had, like Creo, we could download our own copies for free of MATLAB, even if it's a discounted for free, and not free, blah, 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 blah. Uh, have MATLAB for free at home doesn't help. Does not, not having MATLAB at home doesn't help for, for sure. So all these comments are saying we can't have MATLAB at home for free, okay? So the question is, can I have MATLAB at home for free? Well, the answer is no, you can't. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, I want to explain. Now, uh, so I should say you... So I should, I, should, I should now say that you can, you can buy a, a student license for £30, which is a bargain, because if I have to buy it, I, I pay 200 because I'm not a student, or some ridiculous price. So you, you, you can get it. But anyway, you can't have it for free, sad face. Now, this seems unreasonable. Why can't I have it for free? Um, it's because MathWorks, who write MATLAB, simply don't allow it. They don't allow us to give you free copies at all. Um, they want money for it. They want your money. They're, they're, you know, they want to get rich uh, off you. And even so, the company Creo that distributes Creo allows universities to buy a license and then give you copies. I assume. I assume that's how it works. But MATLAB do not allow that. We cannot put you on the university license. They do not allow it. They want money. So we are bound by the terms of the license, and I can't do anything about it. It's like it's not not, not my. You know, it's them. It's not me. Okay. So. This man on the right, on the right, looks a bit like a hippie, and that's because I guess he is. Um, and he was faced with exactly the same problem in 1983. And this man is a very famous man, and he's called Richard Stallman. Okay, and he had a, an up-to-date, uh, highly expensive computer at the time, and he didn't have an operating system for it. So he didn't have anything like so an operating is the thing that sits behind all the programs and, and run, basically runs the programs. And he couldn't run any programs on his computer because he didn't have a free operating system. Um, and he was very upset by this. So what he did is he started something called the free software movement. Okay? And this is a very important cultural uh, sort of movement that as engineers you should probably be aware of. And he, so he, he's a programmer, by the way. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very famous programmer. He's written some very amazing programs that you probably, in fact, you use every day of your life without realizing it. So he'd written lots of software. And then he thought, well, I'm, I'm fed up of having to buy software from people. This is really irritating. So what he did is he wrote a document, and it was a license. He wrote a license, and it was called the General Public License. And this license was very specific. It said, you can have my software for free. Anybody could have my software for free. But if, you, if I give it to you, you've got to give it to anybody else who asks for it. And if they want to change it, you've got to allow them. And what's more, when you give it to other people, you've got to give it to them for free also. So it's like, I give you free software, but you've got to also give that software to other people. And if you change that software, you've also got to give the other people the changes. So it's like, like distribu free distribution of knowledge. So everybody gets everything for free. And if you improve it, please give the improvements to everybody else so, so they, get, they get the better version. Okay? So it's like a license that gives you freedom rather than taking it away, like the MATLAB license, dig, 
Okay? So there's some very, the very, very famous piece of software that use the license. So this, this idea of like a, a free license to where everybody gets the software for free. If you have it, you must give it to other people for free and also let them change it. So there's some very famous products that use his license, so actually the license he wrote. So who's got an Android phone? Yeah? So that's licensed under his license. He wrote the license. So if you, want, if you want a copy of the source code for Android, you can demand it from Samsung or whoever, and you can then give that to other people for free. Firefox, also using a license very similar to his, to so Android. Moodle, you might have heard of, also free software published under his license, uh, and that's the symbol for Octave. And there's literally millions of free programs that all use this idea of free software and giving people a free, free copy of the software, but if you change it, or if somebody wants it, you must give it to them, and if they want to change it, you've got to allow them to. So it's a very, very powerful movement. <coughs> and many companies, like Google, IBM, Intel, their whole business is focused on using free software. So the whole infrastructure is based on free software. And because their whole business depends on it, they put serious money into improving this free software. So they'll improve Android because they want people to use the Google search function on Android. So there's serious money behind this free software, and it's, it's no game. And it's all off the back of this, this, this guy, this Richard Stallman's license. So the idea is give, always giving things back to the community. So I just want to now, how long have I got? I've got like a couple of minutes to get through this. I just want to um, sort of try and show you the power of free software. So imagine you're an engineer working for Samsung. You, you're, in your programming, you're trying to put Android on your new version of, of your Samsung 3 phone. And you're writing code for this. There's a phone. <laughs> and you find a way to save 1% of power. You find a way to save 1% of battery power, OK? And this means your phone lasts 1% longer. And your boss gives you a pat on the, bass, on the back and says, well done, thanks for saving 1% battery power on the device. You're like, brilliant. But because Android is, is this like free software, you must upload it to the internet. You must give it to everybody else for free. So your improved version that saves 1% of the battery power is uploaded to the internet. And what this means is not only does your phone company get better battery power, it means all phones get better battery power that run Android. So you've already like, democratized um, the improved software. But it gets better than that because your new version of your operating system that saves 1% of battery power doesn't only run, run on Android phones, it also runs on supercomputers, it runs on robots, it runs on most maker bots, and it runs in cameras. So your sort of 1% improvement on power in your phone has now, through software, has now been basically distributed through all computing devices that are based on Android, or its relatives thereof. And you've saved 1% of power of all computers throughout the whole world. So you've like made a massive impact by just changing a few lines of code. And this is really the power of free software. Um, <coughs> And um, the other final advantage of free software is basically that because everybody can change the code and look at it, it's very, it's very, very quick to pick up mistakes. So, you know, anybody can find a mistake in the code report and you get, be you get better software. It's a huge cultural movement. And the point is very often the best product for the job is not something you pay for. So very often, you know, Octave is of very often better or as good as MATLAB. So that's it. Any questions on that? So that's just a bit of interest, really. Now then, this is what you've all been waiting for. Last year's exam. <laughs> okay, so we're going to whip through this now. And uh, how are we doing? We've got 10 minutes to, to, to go through this. I'm going to show you basically the format of it. I'm going to show you what I expect. I'm going to give you key, key pointers of what, what to do, what not to do. And then next lecture, if you, if you turn up, I'll try and video it too, but I'm not promising. Um, I'll try and go through questions in, a, in actual detail. Okay? So last year's exam. Now, <coughs> the exam will be written, a written exam with a pen, not a computer. Now, the, you might go, oh, that sounds a really bad idea. But I'll tell you why I do it. I do this because computers crash, computers don't save work, networks go down, MATLAB's got a licensed server that if it doesn't give you a license, you can't do the exam. And there's, you know, even like yesterday in Coatesville, the network went out for an hour. <laughs> And I've just got, I don't want to put people through the stress of broken computers and not save data. So this is why we do it on paper, because paper doesn't crash. And you, you can't, you know, you, paper doesn't like shut down randomly and lose your work. So that's why it's on paper. I just think it's a lot less stressful if I do it that way for everybody. It's 1.5 hours long. No matter what it said on, on the previous papers, it's 1.5 hours long. There'll be four sections to exam. 
There'll be no optional questions, so every, every section is compulsory. Um, you, you will not be allowed to bring notebooks into the exam, phones, laptops, whatever. It's a paper and pen. There'll be lots of marks for comments in your code. So if you write some code, put a comment, and you get some marks. Um, if you're writing functions, I always aw award marks for writing comments above functions, because it's like part of the help system, OK? Um, all comments must be understandable by an English speaker. So that's my level of English competence, OK? That means, so this means text speak is OK, OK? I don't mind text speak. As long as I can understand it, um, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, you get the marks. So grammar out the window, spelling out the window, don't care. Just make it so it's big and I can see it and I'm happy. Yeah. Oh, the other, the other tip is, very often in the exam, I, I say explain, or I explain, I say describe in a few words. And very often when, when I say explain or describe in a few words, I get like a page of English, or like two pages, okay? And if you haven't hit the answer by about word 10, okay, try going to word 40, but if you've still not got the answer, you know, you're probably not going to get it. But what my, my point is that um, when I ask you to explain stuff, I'm looking for like two keywords. I'm not looking for an essay, you know. So right, and if I say in no more than 40 words, I won't penalise you if you go over 40 words, but it's just to stop you spending ages writing, writing English that won't get you any marks. So, you know, I don't want essays. Please do not, if you, if you write more than like that, you've written too much, okay? Definitely too much. <coughs> um... So on the web, I've said this before, but I've only been doing this for one year. No, two years, sorry. So there's two years of past exam papers that I've written using this syllabus. Uh, previously, this was a second-year module, and the papers were a bit harder, and it's called MM2 CPM. Now, I've put those on the web, too, with the answers for you to practice with. Um, do what you want with them. Don't get scared with them, because I didn't write them, and it's not based on this material. It's based on, like, some other random lecture course. But they're still, they might be helpful in your revision. Um, yeah. <coughs> you, yeah. I've said that. Best, best way of preparing is actually getting good at MATLAB. So, like, don't try and cram papers. Cr tr cramming MATLAB papers is a horrible way to prepare for this exam. The best way is to just spend, like, three days in front of a computer and just practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, that's the best way of doing it. And also, f fan I'd say now, fancy functions, like, fancy functions like the sound, the plotting, they aren't going to form a large part of the exam. The, the biggest part of the exam is going to be like, can you write code to do, to do a sorting algorithm, or can you, write, you know, can you write some simple algorithms, you know, that type of thing. So if statements, for statements, while statements, things like that. So easy stuff that you, can, that you can also run with Octave. So you can actually practice with Octave if you want at home, if you don't want to fork out the 30 quid. It's up to you, okay? An example paper. Right, any questions so far? I, I hear muttering at the back. Guy, guy in the white jumper? Any, you got a question? No? How about your friend? No? No? Okay. Do shout if you've got a question. Right. So this is exam paper. Um, 1.5 hours, even though it says one hour, and this is how it goes. So section A is basically a, a giveaway section, okay? I literally give you marks for literally being there. It's that simple. So um, I ask you some really simple one-line one -line questions. So like, for example... Define this matrix in MATLAB. So you can define matrices. You go x equals brackets, uh, 1, 2 plus i, 3, semicolon. You've done this before. You've got 10 marks in the bag there. Um, define an array of random numbers, 6 by 6, rand command, uh, 1, 1 by 6, then multiply it, just multiply operation. So these are like one or two line answers. Plot a graph of sign between 0 and 2 pi with 1,000 points. Evaluate this. So obviously the trap in this is that people often write e hat minus x, which is obviously wrong, because you know that x is e, e, exponential is exp brackets minus x, close brackets. So stuff like that I deduct marks for. Um, final one, you know, just using f open, f close. So practice that a bit. So it's just, just trying to pick bits out of the syllabus, simple, and, and each one is worth, te worth 10 points. So the point I want to make also is, on average, last coursework, people got... Uh, about, so let's say 75%, and that was the average mark, 75, 60%. That's worth 20% of this module. So you've already got in the bag 15%, right? So people normally do slightly worse in coursework two than coursework one. So say you get in the bag, so say you get, I don't know, 60 or, or 50 for coursework two, you maybe got in the bag another 12%. 
so we're already on uh, uh, 27%. So you need another 3% for a hard fail. And another, so, so you need plus 3 for a hard fail. And you need plus 13 for a pass. So after you've been through this section, most people will be on a pass. Okay? So it's like you're going to pass just by, just by doing these simple MATLAB questions. And there's not that many I can ask, I, I can ask you either. Um, the last question, I'm not making a secret of this, the last question in this section will be a very simple question on the hardware lecture. So you remember the computer hardware lecture? There will be a question about that where I just say, describe in five words X, Y, Z. Okay? Section B. So section B is normally writing a little bit more MATLAB code. So like maybe three or four lines. So I'd like you to demonstrate a for loop, demonstrate a while loop, demonstrate the break command, demonstrate something. And often I want you to explain in a few words what it, what it means. Um, I'll say exactly, so read these texts very carefully on the top of the, top of the question because um, they change very slightly from year to year to, and on how you get your marks. So it will say, give me an example or, or explain in a few words and give me an example. So this is, you know, you can write a while loop. You can, I mean, disk command you can do probably in your sleep. So again, each one of these is worth 10 marks. So by this time of the paper, you're definitely on a pass. Well, most people are on a pass now after about... Uh, 20 minutes. Um, right, so section C, how much more time do I have? Oh, I've got two minutes. Section C is basically understanding MATLAB codes. The first one is writing simple MATLAB, MATLAB code. Section C is understanding it. So you get something that looks a bit like that or a bit like that. And they're basically a couple of little algorithms, and I'd like you to basically write. On each, or for each line, so it would be question 13a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, j, k, um, what each line does. So what's, what's 13a do? Clear, right? You clear, clear the memory. Easy. One, one mark. What's this do? What's 13b do? Random array of, 100, of 15. What's this line do? Four, four from one to... Right, so it's not difficult. So you just write that down, you get the marks. Um, this year... Hiding in there somewhere will be a mistake that I would like you to find. It's not a difficult mistake, but you've got, to, you've got to find the mistake. And then I ask you, what's the overall meaning of the code? Okay? So it's basically, what does each line do? What's the meaning of the code? And find the mistake. It's not, it's not difficult. And there's two of these. So you, this is another 30 marks each. So you've already racked up another 60 marks. Okay, so by this point, everybody's on a pass. Then this section D. This section D is basically actually writing your own MATLAB code from scratch. And I, I generally find that section D differentiates between people who get 50% and who get 90%. Okay? So most people pass on the first half of the exam, but then it's, uh, you know, this last section really differentiates between those people who've done loads of work and haven't. Yeah, we've got to go in a minute. So basically, I'll give you, I'll give you a little story, and then I'll I, I give you, uh, like... Uh, uh, and then I, I, I give you a little story, then I, I just write some questions and say, um, you know, please, please calculate the diff distance between these ships or something. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of slightly, slightly more in-depth. And it gets progressively harder as you, as you go through it. I, I find very few people complete the last question in the time, um, but most people do the first one or two. So that's it. So I'll be going through this in lots more detail next week. Any questions about this? I think we've got to go. Any questions? Final questions?